top of a hill, a small mountain actually called Spionkop, uh, here in South Africa. And today we're looking at this epic battle between thousands and thousands of British regulars who are coming from that direction to take this hilltop to continue moving to the east. To they're fighting against the Boers. And the Boers were largely civilians. They band together at a time of crisis and they form commandos and meet the enemy, whoever that enemy is. In this case, it's the British. Yes. What does this battle here have to do with the Marine Corps? Well, I would suggest that it's small groups that rely heavily on small unit action, the initiative of leaders at the lowest levels coming up with ideas, pushing forward with ideas, but furthermore, the organization actually acting upon those ideas. And here there is a perfect example of that in the artillery fire on behalf of the Boers. The gentleman who's doing it this time... Yeah, he's a 19-year-old school teacher. Yeah. He was a member of the, the commando unit. He signaled down to the Boer artillery commander that if the Boer artillery commander had all the guns cease firing, excepting the one gun, he would direct the shell fire onto the target. And the Boer artillery commander immediately took up on that. It had a dramatic impact on the battle. It was within an hour, all seven Boer guns, that's all they had against the British firepower of more than 50 guns. All seven Boer guns started to lay down a barrage on this small area behind where we stand in, which is termed later the Acre of Massacre. British casualties sustained from that artillery fire were absolutely devastating, making this, for its size, one of the bloodiest battlefields in the world. The British had an army of 16,000 men here. Interestingly, they only deployed probably two to two and a half thousand on that day. Mm -hmm. Boer numbers who assault the hill, we'll never really know because they never kept records, but certainly not many more than two or three hundred. And these trenches that are bordered in white are actually mass graves. At the end of the battle, they literally pile the bodies into the trenches. Yeah, the official account suggests that the number buried here is 270 odd. I think it's probably conservative. Yeah. It might be in the 300s. Yeah. There are some buried elsewhere, yes. Okay. And it was because of that artillery fire coming from this direction that was directed by the gentleman on the hill over here directly on top of their position. That's correct. Some of the Boer artillery were pom-pom uh, heavy machine guns that were firing at maximum range. And at maximum range meant that the shells were falling down. The trenches were inadequate to begin with, but any shell that fell in the trench, of course, created devastation. And all because of that one uh, young man one young exercising man. little initiative in the face of battle. Yes, yeah. the other the other very valid point is if you look at the British uh, behavior in the early part of the battle, there was simply zero initiative. Yeah. When an officer in charge of a small squad was killed, the squad simply froze yep. and ran back into the trench and another officer with his men had to take over that position. So there was no devolution of command. Mm -hmm. It's something that the British Army, I think, battled with for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So, much like the Marine Corps, we put a lot of trust, a lot of confidence in our young people, our young Marines, to identify issues and to push forward in the attack, no matter if that's on the battlefield or in their position in the service corps somewhere. Uh, we rely heavily on that. You can see why we do, because it's issues like these that oftentimes turn the battle and, uh, and uh, make armies great.